Our call to worship comes from Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. God calls us into His worship by His Word. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land. Young camels of Midian and Ephah and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. All Keter's flocks will be gathered to you. The rams of Neboeth will serve you. They will be accepted as offerings on my altar and I will adorn my glorious temple. Who are these that fly along like clouds, like doves to their nests? Surely the islands look to me. In the lead are the ships of Tarshish, bringing your sons from afar with their silver and gold to the honor of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for He has endowed you with splendor. Foreigners will rebuild your walls and their kings will serve you. Though in anger I struck you in favor, I will show you compassion. Your gates will always stand open. They will never be shut, day or night, so that men may bring you the wealth of the nations, their kings led in triumphal procession. For the nation or kingdom that will not serve you will perish. It will be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the pine, the fir, the cypress together, to adorn the place of my sanctuary, and I will glorify the place of my feet. The sons of your oppressors will come bowing down before you. All who despise you will bow down at your feet and will call you the city of the Lord. Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Amen. Turn your Bibles to our scripture reading in Acts chapter 19, picking up in verse 21 to the end of the chapter. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I've been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty." When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven. Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against enemy, the courts are opened and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal 
assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. The Lord bless the reading of his word. The book of Acts, among other things, is the record of the gospel of Jesus Christ confronting the many popular forms of idolatry in the first century. We've seen, as we've gone through the book of Acts, how different situations and different audiences call for different approaches to the gospel presentation, different messages between Paul and the other early Christians. But while the audiences were different and the messages may have different variations, their goal was always similar. Repent from wickedness, turn from worthless idols that cannot save, and serve the one true God through faith in Jesus Christ the Lord. And we've seen how Christianity has met different resistance from different groups of people within this Roman and Greek civilization. Christianity was first resisted by the Jews, both in Jerusalem and throughout the empire. Of course, the Jews had made an idol out of their heritage. They had made an idol of their status before God and an idol out of the temple system and so rejected the message of the good news of the gospel of Jesus by salvation, by grace, through faith. And we also saw how the Christian message drew resistance from idol-worshipping Greeks. At Lystra and Derby, the Greeks mistook Paul and Barnabas for Hermes and Zeus and wanted to worship them. And when Paul and Barnabas told them no, the people ended up stoning Paul. At Philippi and Thessalonica, Paul and Silas were charged with violating the laws of Rome by advocating customs unlawful for Romans to accept or practice. They had claimed that there was another king besides Caesar. And what you can see very clearly from our scriptures is that those committed to emperor worship rejected the gospel, and they rejected it for a very logical reason. And then going on to Athens, Paul faced resistance to his message from the philosophers of the day, the intelligentsia of the Greco-Roman world, and they resisted Paul's logical critique of worshiping idols made by man's hands as gods. Why worship a god that is something that you made with your hands? This was a critique that Paul brought to the men at Athens. And today we come to another example of resistance to the gospel in the form of the cult of Artemis, but specifically by those who had an economic interest in the temple of Artemis within Ephesus. Now, all these forms of idolatry, and they're very different forms of idolatry that we see taking place through the book of Acts, all of these different forms of idolatry have something in common, something that fueled their resistance to Christianity. What they all had in common was insecurity. The Jews knew that their way of life was insecure because they lived at the mercy of Rome. And Jesus exacerbated that insecurity because the people lacked faith to believe his message. They were more interested in the security of Rome than they were in believing his message as the Messiah. And that's one of the reasons why they crucified him. The agrarian idolatry of Lystra and Derby was insecure since nature cannot always be relied upon for protection from disease, famine, and pestilence. And the religion of emperor worship was insecure because no emperor lives forever. This is one of the problems of the Roman Empire in changing from one emperor to the next with their emperor worship. Even the philosophers at Athens were divided among themselves into Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And one thing about the story of secular philosophy is that secular philosophy is an endeavor shrouded with mental insecurity. That's why there are so many different philosophical systems out there is because no one's secure in what they believe or why they believe it. Well, in our text today, in Acts 19, Demetrius and the silversmith tradesmen attacked Paul and the Christians because of their financial insecurity caused by the success of the gospel. And it's no coincidence here that idolatry and insecurity go together in the record of Acts. And the reason it's no coincidence is because all idolatry breeds insecurity and all insecurity reflects idolatry. If you just think about that the relationship, you might understand how this is taking place in our text. All idolatry breeds insecurity, and all insecurity reflects idolatry. Even the idols worshipped in our modern age struggle with the challenge of insecurity. And what I hope to show you from Acts 19, this riot at, at Ephesus, is that what takes place here is nothing that is unique to Paul's day, but it's actually related to our experience in the world today. And once we can recognize the insecurity of the idolatry that we see presented for us in our text will be much more effective at presenting the, the, the only solution to the insecurity that we see in our day. And that only solution for the security in life 
is the peace of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So insecurity is really the weakness of idolatry. And we'll see how that works out in our text in Acts chapter 19. So let's go to our text and begin reading in Acts 19, beginning verse 21. After all this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I had been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. You see here like an echo of Paul's message at Athens that man-made gods are no gods at all. If you remember back, I have to probably lay some, some cultural background here to really get to the issues of our text. If you remember back to Bo's sermon a few weeks ago in Revelation 2 in the letters to the churches, one of the letters, of course, was to Ephesus. And you'll remember a little bit about the glory of the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was an ancient city that historically relied on shipping and trade. Yet they had one geographical problem that actually hindered them and actually caused part of their demise. Their shipping and their harbor was inland from the sea. And what happened was the waterways that reached this harbor continued to silt up because of erosion in the surrounding area, because deforestation, overgrazing, and burning of various fuels. The slopes would actually erode down into the sea and cause the harbor to fill up. So they continuously dredged this harbor so that these ships could come in and out and continue their trading and shipping routes. Well, by this particular time in its history, Ephesus was far past its prime when it came to trade, but it had another booming commercial activity that contributed to its economic success. Ephesus had the temple of Artemis or Diana, depending on what translation you're reading. Artemis is the Greek name for this goddess, and Diana is the Roman name or Latin name for this goddess of fertility. And Artemis or Diana was a female god whose statue bore the face of a woman and had a multi-breasted body. It was the goddess of fertility. So all the sex sex symbols that were a part of it were right at the forefront of Diana. And this temple here that we read about, the Temple of Artemis, was magnificent. In fact, it was considered as one of the seven architectural wonders of the ancient world. In fact, if you go over there now, the ruins of the Temple of Artemis still remain and there's still a very popular place for visitors to go look and see at the massive size of this temple. But uh, this religious cult drew fanatical pilgrims from all over, and by this time, the prosperity of Ephesus depended heavily on this religion of Artemis. It depended on food and lodging for the tourists that were coming to the temple. It depended on the selling of the Artemis statues. It depended on selling um, offerings that were offered in the temple. And not only did the temple lead to a booming tourist economy. It also was actually a bank. It was one of the foremost banks of the ancient world because what people would do, the wealthy and even towns, entire towns, would put their money on deposit in Ephesus in this temple because it was a sacred spot and all this money would be protected under deity, this deity named Artemis. So the entire city's economic well-being revolved around this temple. Now here comes Paul preaching that the divine being is not a statue made by human hands. Here comes Paul preaching that the divine being does not live in temples made by hands. And as Christianity spread through this region of Asia and throughout Rome, the the tradesmen saw their economic interests threatened. Who would buy their statues if people stopped believing in Artemis? What would happen to the economy if people stopped coming to Ephesus to offer worship and sacrifice? Would the banking industry continue if the divine majesty of Artemis was itself called into question? And that's really what Demetrius was relying on here is to keep the status quo. The growth 
and success of Christianity presented a threat to the fat and prosperous status quo in Ephesus, and it was the basis for Demetrius' meeting with the tradesmen. They knew that their commercial way of life was threatened by Jesus Christ. And this is really a testament here to the success of Christianity. We sometimes miss that, but Christianity was overtaking the world at this point in time, the, the Roman Empire, and it was really cutting into the pockets of those that made their living off of idolatry. Let's continue in verse 28. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. You might think of this as a strange way of looking at this account, but there is actually something commendable about the cult of Artemis that we tend to miss. One thing that set the cult of Artemis apart from the other pagan idolatries in this Roman civilization was the fanatical devotion demonstrated by its followers. And if you read about emperor worship, emperor worship was really just one of those things that people were committed to because of political expediency. Emperor worship was really not held with great devotion in the Roman Empire, at least at this point in time. Also, the gods of Homer were something that people did hold to. They did hold to the pantheon, the Olympian gods, Zeus and all the other gods. But they also did not believe that these gods paid any attention to human life. And so, of course, if you think that you have all these gods up there that are just like men but doing their own thing, but they really don't care about us, you can see why that would not foster a great deal of devotion. Artemis was different, though. Artemis drew fanatical support from its followers and you can see that in our text how the men of Athens confronted their insecurity by shouting down Paul's companions. Even the fact that the tradesmen of Athens made a killing from the business of the Ephesian temple showed that the followers of Artemis all across the empire were willing to put their money where their mouth was. And that is something that's very commendable when you compare that devotion to the Christian scene in America. I saw a recent statistic this week about what American Christians actually give on an average. And it's interesting because it's not very different in America from being a Christian or just being a non-Christian, the percentage of of what people actually give. Christians in America on average give between 2 and 3% of their money to their congregations and to charity. And that level of miserly giving shows just the opposite of what we see here among the pagans with their devotion. It shows... It reflects how Christians in America, in America are not dedicated to the ministry of God's church. And these ancient pagans put the modern Christians to shame because of what they were willing to give for their God. And if you think back to what Jesus said about where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You see how these people had this idea of, of putting their money where their treasure was. It was a simple basic fact of life. Their heart was in their religion even though it was a false religion, and they demonstrate their devotion by how they gave to their God. They really do embarrass American Christians who demonstrate how little their heart is in the work of God's ministry by how little they give. And if you wonder why so many Christians in America have financial difficulties, a big reason is because Christians have their priorities all messed up. And if you think about this, This is the way it works in America today. American Christians complain that the money is tight and use that as an excuse to give miserly to God's work. That's the logic that we have in American scenes today. And the problem is with that is that we start with ourselves and then confuse the causes with the effects. We got exactly backwards. In American churches today, everything is backwards. Our gifts are not small because our finances are insufficient. Our finances are insufficient because our gifts are small. And that's really um, something here, the contrast between the devotion of these pagans, how that puts American Christians to shame. Because American, American Christians do not give very much to their congregations. They do not give very much to the charities, if they even give at all. And it's all a result of a lack of faith in God's promises to bless those who give sacrificially and a lack of true devotion to the ministry of the gospel. 
What it boils down to is that those who do not give are not devoted to God's ministry. These people gave and they were devoted to Artemis. And you can see how they, this devotion boiled up within them when they were confronted with this insecurity. And it boiled up and it caused a major, major riot in the city of Ephesus. Or you could think of it this way. If Jesus commended the widow for giving her might to the maintenance of the earthly temple, how much more is he pleased when we give sacrificially to support the ministry of the living temple on earth, the body of Christ in each congregation of which we are a part? If it is true for the temple, if this is a blessing in the temple, how much more this true spiritual temple on earth, the body of Jesus Christ? These pagans had faith in their God and were devoted to their religion which shows up in their actions, and American Christians could really learn from these pagans about this, something that we can learn from. Verse 32, The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis! of the Ephesians. It's hard to miss how the insecurity of the Ephesians led them to rash action and great confusion. And just compare here between what the Ephesians did in their insecurity and what Paul did in his security. They were upset about losing money and they were ready to do rash action because of their loss of money. Paul was ready to go before a raving mob in order to spread the gospel. Look at the difference between the security of Paul and the insecurity of the Ephesians. Now this text really shows the obvious symptom of insecurity and that is rash action and confusion. When people are insecure, they engage in erratic and unpredictable behavior. It's something that you can just think about whenever you're tempted for rash action. Why am I tempted to rash action? Well, generally speaking, Sooner or later, at the bottom, there's some kind of insecurity there. And we can see how this works out in our culture everywhere we look. Everywhere you look, you look at the insecurity of this country driving this entire society into rash action just like what you have here. What was the rationale for going to war in Iraq? It was based on this same cause and effect. Supposedly, Iraq threatened our well-being through some undefined connection to terrorism. And that insecurity was fostered by the interest of our leaders to a rash war. And now, of course, there's great confusion about it. And the same goes for the Patriot Act. You look at what happened with, with the, the attack on the Twin Towers, how that threw our entire culture into great insecurity because of our faith was in those institutions. Our faith was in, in that system. And then you have, of course, as a direct result, you have this rash passing of the Patriot Act where people who passed it, who voted for it, never even read the thing. I mean, if that's not rash action based in security, I don't know what is. Or think of how the welfare state developed. Do you think there might be a reason they call it social security? Interesting implication there. If you don't have this program, you will be insecure in your old age. And that's how it was passed. That's how it was pushed. That insecurity was manipulated to develop a gigantic fraud. If you look at government health programs, you look at the gigantic insurance industry, all these things are based in an idolatrous insecurity that we see examined right here with the Ephesians. The insecurity leads to rash action and confusion. And what's true in our culture at large is also true of individuals. People make the most bizarre decisions and and actions when they are insecure and it's a danger. The reason this is so important to understand when we see this happening to the early Christians is so that when we see it happening in our culture, we will not be surprised when people use all kinds of insecurity-based pleas to engage in rash decisions that might affect us negatively. We can see it happening right here. So when we understand what insecurity does, where it comes from, we can really understand our culture and understand how to react. When we understand how idolatry is related to insecurity, which causes rash action, we'll understand something very basic about our American world. You know, the problem with our American world is not the government. 
The problem with our world is not that they pass bad laws that we all have to live with. That is not the problem that we face in America. The problem is much more fundamental than that. Its roots go much deeper than the actual passing of any particular policy of any particular law. In America, here's the problem. In America, over the last hundred years or so, the idols have multiplied. The idol of wealth, the idol of the messianic state, the idol of the self, the idol of my rights to do what the hell I want, the idol of youth, All these idols that people worship naturally develop a deep-seated insecurity in American life. And I believe we're impacted by all these insecurities because we bring our culture into the church with us. And when we bring our, when we come into the church, we don't realize sometimes what kind of baggage we bring into the church and it causes all these problems. I believe we're impacted by this far more than we would like to admit. There are habits that we bring right in with us. And this insecurity drives people to do irrational, ignorant, and dangerous things. And what happens is our political leaders, as a result of this underlying idolatrous insecurity, they just compete to see who can best fulfill the desires of the insecure people. That's why I say our problem is not the government. Our problem is the idols. The ultimate problem begins with the people and their idols. All else follows. So the only way to reverse the tide is for the gospel to conquer the idols in the hearts and minds and hands and feet in America. You cannot reverse the tide with political action or a political party. It's been tried. It's been wasted. Money's been wasted. Effort's been wasted, which is a shame, but it's, it's a failure. Nor can you do it with something like Patriot Radio or the Patriot Movement. It doesn't work that way. Those are band-aids for a terminal problem. You can't do it by blaming the government. Getting everybody mad at the government doesn't work. It's not enough. It doesn't get to the root of the problem, which is the idolatry, which leads to the insecurity, which leads to the rash and illogical action, dangerous action. Nor is it some dark conspiracy by omnipotent men behind the scenes pulling all the strings. These things are very simple to understand once you see what's going on in Ephesus. The problem is that the idols have our hearts minds and bodies, just like they had the hearts, minds, and bodies of Demetrius and the craftsmen who relied on it for their living. And the problem is that there's no difference now between conservatives or liberals in our, in our culture. The idols have them all. And there's just one big mad rush to fulfill the insecurities of what people want. More government programs, more protection, more handouts, more security, of course, which leads because it's all a false view of the world, which leads to greater insecurity. I mean, I don't know about you, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's going to happen with Social Security and what it's going to cause in our culture. Sooner or later, near or far, it will not lead to Social Security. It will do just the opposite because it's based in an idol. It's based in a false worship. The only solution to the situation we find ourselves in is repentance from these idols in our land and faith in God who is the one who can give peace and real security. That's the solution. The idols have to be conquered. That repentance, of course, starts with us when we repent from our own idolatrous insecurities and self-centered habits and desires. We learn how to do that here in the congregation. That's what we're all part of as a a congregation. We learn how to get bad behavior and, and sinful activity out in the open out, dealt with, and moved on so that our security becomes progressively more and more in Christ. And, of course, we are a people prone to golden calf worship. So we have this struggle, we have this temptation all the time to make up golden calves as we go to, set, to, to separate us from the true worship of God. Once we have security in Christ, we will be content with what we have in true gratitude, showing respect and grace to one another. And this is what America used to look like. Because America had gratitude for what they had, because they recognized their blessing as from God, and because they, they in general, rejected outright idolatry in the early days of our country, we had this security. And it reflected out into the culture. Once you deal with that, once you re, um, regain the security in Christ that only the true religion of Christ brings, then the driving cause for rash and ignorant action, faithless insecurity, evaporates, and ultimately, the rash and illogical actions cease. And so godless insecurity is really a blight. It's a spiritual blight 
that mars our physical lives. And if you look at the culture around you, you see how that works out. It's a very profound thing. It's something we see right here in our text, how this insecurity of Demetrius and the, and the tradesmen, their threat on their lifestyle, their threat on their way of life, led them into a very uh, dangerous situation. This really was a dangerous situation for the Christians and actually for Ephesus as well, which is why the clerk comes out and says what he says. Continuing in verse 35. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell down from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. The city clerk or executive officer, as it were, of the city is the one responsible for maintaining order under the regional authorities in the city. And you notice how he responds to the riot. He says that all the world knows that Ephesus is the guardian of the temple and that Artemis' image fell down from heaven or from Zeus. And incidentally, I'll say that um, this is a real good example of how the biblical era mind thought of the world as that civilization, the Greco-Roman civilization, not necessarily a, a physical globe as we think of it today in our scientific day. And that's also demonstrated back in verse 27. If you notice back in verse 27... They say that the, the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world. So they had this idea that this worship was going out in the world. And we know historically that the, the Diana worship was based in Greco-Roman civilization. You didn't have Diana worship in, in the, the, American, uh, the American continent. You didn't have it in Mongolia or Australia. It was, it was based in the Roman civilization. And just one, one of those examples here, how the biblical mind thinks of a world. But what the clerk does to calm the writing crowds is introduce some cool logic and reinforce their certainty of their position as Ephesians. His claim is that the image of Artemis fell from heaven is actually probably based on loosely on historical fact. Ancient historians agree that the roots of the cult of Artemis probably spring from a meteorite that landed near Ephesus. And this meteorite, according to the stories, had the rough figure of a woman with many breasts. At least that's what they saw when they saw this rock that fell down from heaven. And it's somewhat logical if you think about it because meteorites kind of burn as they come down so they get kind of bubbly and you can see very logically why somebody would think that when they see this image that fell from heaven. And of course, if you remember, all the way through the book of Acts, these people were very superstitious. They were ready to attribute anything out of the ordinary to the divine happenstance. That's why when Paul and Barnabas were in Lystra and Derby and they healed somebody. And people jumped to the conclusion that this is Hermes and Zeus. And we'll see later on something very similar happens on Malta when Paul is shipwrecked on Malta and he's bit by a poisonous snake and nothing happens. And the islanders of Malta jumped to the conclusion that this is now a god before them. And so they attributed this rock falling from the sky as some kind of special omen, some special god that was sent to them. So there is some, actually some historical basis for this, and I think that's why he is, um, why the town clerk is basing his idea here on the security of what actually happened. There was probably actually something that did happen, although the interpretation is up for, up for uh, debate. Well, all false religion is based on a perversion of biblical Christianity. You know, Christians actually believe something similar to the cult of Artemis. Think about it. Christians believe that the divine image came from heaven. Jesus claimed that. In John 6, 38, he said, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And of course, Paul talks about Jesus being the divine image of the invisible God. So you have this interesting perversion here with Artemis. And all idolatry is perversion of some, some of God's truth. So we see this happening. But notice the, notice the differences here, because the differences are what make uh, the difference between idol worship and the true religion of Jehovah. Artemis is a rock from the sky. Jesus is sent from God, born of a woman, suffered, died, buried, rose again, and then ascended into heaven. One is inert material, mineral, and the other is a living person. One's a fluke of nature, the other is purposed love. Remarkable difference here. Artemis makes no claim of covenant union and communion. Jesus lives within his people. He lives within Zion. 
And that's exactly why the gospel banishes worldly insecurity from life. That's exactly why Paul was chomping at the bit to go before this rioting crowd. Because he knew what God he served. And you look at what, ha- what happened with these... I mean, really, what can, you, what can you worry about? Why is, there, why is there a reason for insecurity if you believe that this is the God you serve? Once you serve and worship the eternal God, what is there really in the end to be worried about? If God loved you enough to order the entire plan of redemption in history to save you, don't you think he can take care of you right where you are? Wherever that may be. Obviously, the tradesmen of Ephesus did not believe Artemis could take care of them and stand up for herself and her followers. That's their insecurity. And that weakness betrays the weakness of their idol. They could not rely on Artemis to take care of them. But we don't serve a God like that, some bubbly rock from the sky. And that's what is the source of our security in Christ. That's why, through faith, we can become bold as lions and have confidence that Paul has here and demonstrates all through the book of Acts because we are secure in Christ. The bottom line is there is a great security that true faith and worship of God leads naturally to. And many in our world mistake this for arrogance. And I will admit to you that security can become arrogance if it's faithless security. But there is such a thing as faithful security and it leads to boldness. It is in reality godly confidence. Confidence that the God who came down from heaven for his people is the same God who loves to give gifts to his people and protects him as his very own treasure. We are God's treasure, which means we are where God's heart is. I mean, if you think about what Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's just a statement of fact that we see in our world, but it's also a statement of fact in God's relationship to us. And once we see that reality and participate in that reality by faith, it leads to a great security. We are God's treasure. He bought us with a price. We are where God's heart is. And that will lead to great boldness. Once we accept that reality by faith, all the insecurities of life fade into nothing. All the motivations for rash, illogical behavior evaporate and we can be at peace with each other as we live in covenant peace with God. And when we are at peace with God, we will be at peace with our brothers in whom God lives. It's that relationship between God's people and God himself. God lives in his people. So, the comparison and contrast here between the religion of Artemis and Diana and the worship of the one true God has profound implications for our daily lives together. It has profound implications for what we see going on in our culture today. Because, really, human nature hasn't changed. Idolatry hasn't changed. The details have it have. But the worship of the true God hasn't changed. And we can see these same basic principles playing out over and over and over again throughout history. In fact, we're living in a time very much like the end of the Roman civilization, the end of the Greek civilization. I don't know about anybody else, but I heard Andy Rooney a few weeks ago on 60 Minutes, and I was floored by what he said. I'm no big fan of 60 Minutes or Andy Rooney, but he came out flat out and said it. He says, all these great civilizations, the story of history is the story of these great civilizations that rise and fall. And he says, for once, he was talking about the prisoner abuse scandal in Iraq and some other things, but for once, I've got this faint, foggy idea that maybe some way, way down the road, my grandkids are going to live in a civilization that collapses. Remarkable, remarkable, remarkable statement. Verse 37. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. The end of the story is that the city clerk prevails on the mob to cease and desist the riot and release Alexander the Jew and the two Christian companions of Paul. And the reason that the clerk's words had the impact that they did was that the Romans did not appreciate social unrest, rioting, chaos, etc. And their position as a favored city of Ephesus could be jeopardized by their actions. You could send the Roman armies in and take care of the problem, and nobody in the Roman Empire wanted that. 
Nobody wanted that. But even at a more, more than just a pragmatic idea here, what the clerk is saying is actually morally true. The clerk shows that there was no material reason for the riot in the first place. The Christians had not robbed temples nor blasphemed the goddess. If there were damages that needed to be addressed, then they could be pursued in the established court according to recognized law. And notice that the established, clearly defined lawful authority and order was a great blessing for Paul and the Christians in the Ephesian experience. We tend to read over accounts like this and miss how lawful order, even when it involves pagans, can be a great blessing and check on unbelievers. And I believe in all of life that it is really lawful order that it enables us to live stable lives, not governed by immediate passions, not not ruled by uh, desires and emotions that are all mixed up and constantly changing. And really, what happens when you throw off all lawful authority, what happens is your emotions and your desires become the immediate law of the moment. It's not like you're ending law because you're going to be governed by law regardless. It's that you change law from something that's established, recognized, and, and concrete to whatever pops into your head at the moment. So this is really a good demonstration of how lawful order can be a real blessing to God's people. And it really does serve as a check against mobocracy that we see so prevalent in our day. So don't let anybody tell you that all established lawful authority is automatically evil. Because this is one example of many in Scripture where the lawful authority, lawful order, was a great benefit. And the problem here is not the order itself. The problem is when the order is abused. The problem is when law and order are perverted and abused. And it doesn't really matter what covenant institution you apply this to because the rules are the same for all of God's covenant institutions, family, church, and state. When lawful order is abused, that's when it becomes a curse. When lawful order accomplishes God's purposes and ministers to God's righteousness and justice, it's a great blessing. And that's really the distinction here that we see. Fathers and mothers who govern their household as God would have them to are a great blessing to their family. And the same is true of church government. The same is true of civil government. The problem is not authority. That's not the problem. The problem is abuse of authority. In this case, the lawful order was instrumental into ending this abuse by the mob. And that's really what all good lawful orders should be designed to do. It should be designed to end abuse checks and balances, and provide a a disciplined environment in which God's righteousness and justice can grow. There's one more thing about this account that I really am not going to go into today, but it has many implications. I'll just throw it out there for you. You notice all the times in this text where the word assembly is used of the Ephesian body politic. The word is used by Luke in verse 32, verse 39, and verse 41. Does anybody know what that word might be in the Greek? Very good. The word is ecclesia, from which we get the term church. That's an interesting detail to ponder. Think about how Luke is using this term in regard to a city, in regard to an organization, body politic, whatever you want to call it. And we tend to think of ecclesia as something that the Christians dreamed up, something that we just invented when Christ came on the scene to build his church. And it's just not true. Historically, the word ecclesia had been used for centuries before the coming of Christ. And it was used for centuries in this in this Greek city-state relationship of a body of people. In fact, some would argue that uh, the Christians really ripped off the idea from the pagans, which they did with a lot of different things. The ecclesia were the ones who had certain benefits and obligations to the city. The ecclesia were the ones who were recognized as citizens. The ecclesia were the ones who were the called out, who were the ones that were voting, so to speak, and governing the affairs of of that congregation, ecclesia, or city-state. And one of the implications of this, if you really think about it, this is actually a very unique place in Scripture where ecclesia is used of secular bodies. It's used much more about Christian bodies, congregations. One of the implications is is that a local congregation and even the congregation as a whole in all of God's world, is a spiritual town with specified rules, order, authorities, and everything else. 
That's the way it works. The pattern here is beautiful if you think about the Greek city-states and how they worked. And by the way, the Greek politics is something we still live with. You know, you look at the American scene. I believe one of the great reasons for the success of the American scene was not just because of the morality of our culture, but because they understood the nature of man and they understood the nature of government. They were relying on many classical things, but they were also relying on very Christian ideas and it was all mixed up together. And there were some compromises there. There were some shortcomings. But here we see how close the idea of the ecclesia, the Greek city-state, and the idea of the city of God in history are brought together because he uses the same term for both. And this is really something that comes up in our Bibles more and more if you think about Revelation, the city of God coming down from heaven prepared as a bride. It's all wrapped up here together in this way this language is used. I believe Luke's use of the word ecclesia here goes a long way to illuminate the biblical pattern for congregational life that we neglect at our own peril. And we'll look more at the biblical pattern of structure and function in the early church, uh, particularly in Acts 20. We'll get to a place in Acts 20 where I think it's helpful to go in and, and investigate what actually took place in the biblical situation. But um, let's go to God in prayer with hearts filled with gratitude for what he has done for us. Let's pray.